Hi, I'm Caroline Levin. I'm the co-founder of Mighty Blaze, the book initiative that began when the pandemic shut everything down. Um, <clears throat> it was meant to open up the shuttered bookstores and to reconnect writers to readers. And we're going on four now. So Mighty Blaze is just about a toddler. So today is kind of amazing because we're having on this author, Lauren Grodstein, who's been a friend of mine for a very, very long time. We're both Algonquin authors. And the most amazing thing about her is that her book has come out and we were just talking about how I, I read it before it came out. And from the first page, I knew, I knew that this was something spectacular and incredible. And you shouldn't listen to me. Listen to Kirkus, who named it one of the best books of the year. Listen to the New York Times, who raved about the book. Listen to the Today Show and Jenna, who made it a book club pick. Listen to, let's see what else. Oh, people magazine made it a book of the week and <clears throat> all over the place it's getting so much incredible praise and it should be because it's extraordinary and i can't wait to talk about it so lauren grodstein is the author of five novels including the new york times bestseller a friend of the family um and i just want to tell you lauren i just bought an extra copy of that as well as we must not think of ourselves for my 27 year old son because i know he's going to love this and i love that we read the same books okay and the washington post book of the year the explanation for everything lauren's work has been translated into french turkish german hebrew and other languages and her essays and reviews have been widely published. She teaches at the MBA, MFA program, MBA, MFA program at Rutgers University, Camden, and lives in New Jersey with her husband and children. Her new novel, We Must Not Think of Ourselves, is a Jenna Today Show pick, People Magazine Best Book, a Kirkus Review Best Book of the Year, and it just got a rave New York Times. Washington Post said it's a gripping historical novel. Madeline Miller said this book is a masterpiece, and I would echo that. It's totally, totally a masterpiece piece. We Must Not Think of Ourselves brings this terrifying chapter of history to readers, but it's also the story of one man, Adam, as well as a whole people. And it, it's all about who can you save? It's, it's about what was going on at the Warsaw Ghetto. It's about so many different things. And I'm so excited to have you here, Lauren. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Now you can talk. I'll shut up. You are the best. You are the best. You are the best booster and friend to writers, as well as an extraordinary writer yourself. And you and I have the same wedding anniversary and our sons were born on the same day. Not the same year. Okay. That's, so that's, that's, that's just one thing whenever I do it, it's something I feel like the world should know. Um, thank you so much for, for having me here. It's so much fun to, to see your face. Well, it's wonderful to have you here. So let's start with, I have so many questions. And I know people are going to have a lot of questions. Let's start with the origin story, which I know, which is an extraordinary story. Um, why don't you tell us where you were when you thought about writing this book and tell us a little bit about the background and especially the archives. Sure. So in 2019, my sister took uh, our extended family, my sisters and her husband, to Poland in honor of my nephew's bar mitzvah. Um, it was a long kind of grueling trip. And toward the end of it, when everyone else peeled off to go see the soccer stadium, my parents, my sister and I stumbled into this archive. We knew nothing about it. It was called the Jewish Historical Institute. You walk into it and on the wall is written in uh, Hebrew and Polish and English um, what we could not shed out to the world. Well, that, that's interesting. I, I wonder what that means. And then you walk up some stairs and into this room and you learn the story of these 32 archivists. We know only, there might have been more. We know 32 of them who, under the direction of an historian named Emanuel Ringelblum, understood that what was happening in the Warsaw Ghetto, which was a locked ghetto in the middle of the city containing the world's second largest Jewish community, which had been in Warsaw at the time, that they knew that this was like a, a crucial moment in the history of Polish Jews and therefore in the history of Jews around the world. And so they decided that they were going to write everything down. They were going to write it all down. They were going to deny the Nazis the opportunity to, to, to lie, to, to tell their own story. So they began taking interviews with people. They wrote down diary entries. They did studies of starvation. They took newspapers and they did, made drawings. And they just, they, they collected thousands upon thousands of pages. 
before the Great Deportation in 1942, they buried the first tranche of pages in the ground, and before the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which ended up ending the ghetto, um, they buried the rest. In 1946, after the war, the three surviving members, again, that we know of, came and dug up the treasure. They dug up the rest in 1950. One part of it is still buried somewhere in Warsaw. So there's still documents that nobody has. If you go to the archive today, you will see uh, all, you can you can look at the pages, the actual pages that people wrote. And also there's a meticulous translation that's available both at the site in Warsaw and online. So I, when I was writing the book, I was able to check my records or check my notes by just going online. Um, it's it's a it's an amazing resource. It's an amazing story. It's amazing to me that more people don't know about it. Certainly, some people do, but but I went through Hebrew school. I you know I learned all the stuff and I knew nothing about this. I knew nothing about it either, which is what was so astonishing. Um, I wanted to talk about. First of all, the writing is just exquisite. And there's something about the writing and the title. The title is We Must Not Think of Ourselves. Now, having grown up in a Jewish household myself, when I hear that, I think first of my mom, a Jewish mother, saying, oh, we must not think of ourselves. Right. But it's yeah. not really about that. Because actually, in your novel, I had the feeling that it was also about we must think about ourselves. We must think about ourselves as part of the human race. We must think about ourselves in terms of who can we help. And what can we do for people? Because to me, this novel seemed not to be so much, well, it was very much about one individual, Adam Pascal, a teacher who starts his own kind of archival collection of stories. But it's also about a community of people, the Jewish people, in tremendous, tremendous trouble and getting through this devastation and being able to tell their own stories. So I wanted to know from you, Am I wrong? <laughs> Am I wrong about that? Or did you feel that? Because when I saw the title, you know, I instantly had like my regular middle of the road Jewish reaction that, oh, that's a Jewish thing to say. And then when I read the book, I thought it's much more profound and multi-layered than that. Can you talk about that? Well, I mean, I love, I love that interpretation. I was actually uh, thinking, first of all, I'm terrible at titles. And so I threw some out to some writer friends and a writer friend of mine said, oh, I think that's the one. And I was glad she picked it. I liked it too, because it's, it's a call to Shiva in a way. You know, during Shiva, which is the Jewish mourning period, seven days after someone dies, you put cloth over the mirrors or you turn the mirrors around, you sit on boxes, you try to make yourself uncomfortable. You're not supposed to think about yourself. You're supposed to think about the person who passed. Right. So in some way, this title, you know, nobody said Shiva for these, these people. And so in a way, it's a call to that. It's a call to memorializing. One of the things I wanted to do in this book, um, and I did it, I tried, I tried to do it through these interviews, was to regain some of the lives of people who really are only known by the means of their deaths, right? Once you were killed in the Holocaust, you become a Holocaust victim. That is your right. life story. That's but right. These were people who had rich, involved lives before that. And I, I really found myself wanting to try to memorialize this group of people. And so that's also what the title is about. I love the title. In the book, a character says, it is up to us to write our own history to make sure it's not written by the Germans, which is what you just said. How do we now ensure that our own American history stays intact? Oh, when textbooks are being rewritten, um, things or people and places are being erased. It's kind of 1984 coming to life. And I don't... I don't really know what we should do about it. I mean, it's such a good question. I don't, I wish I had a smart answer. I, I, are you terrified about the future or do you feel that? Well, you know, love and <laughs> listen, you, 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 yeah, yes and no, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. But at the same time, you have a kid, I have kids. Like, I have to believe that there is a future for them. I wouldn't be able to exist if I didn't. So I have to believe that they will go and make the world better, which is a huge burden to place on them. But I'll tell you, I work with young people. I live with some young people. They're pretty smart and they, yeah. they are so much better than we are about so many things. And they're able to just cut through the nonsense. They, they, they don't buy into the same paradigms that we just grew up with and assumed were okay. Like, of course there are gonna be poor people, or of course, you know, there's gonna be, like we, we just grew up 
I grew up, I shouldn't say we, I grew up assuming that things just were how they were and there wasn't much I could do to change that. And the kids I know don't believe that. And that I think is pretty profound. That's pretty profound. I, I just want to tell listeners out there, I've put handy links in the chat so you can order all of Lauren's books and all of them are like, just super, super wonderful. Um, also, if you have questions, pop them in the chat. I see we already have some. I'm going to get to them in a while because I'm really selfish and I have to ask my questions first. All right. So Adam says at first that he barely remembered that he was a Jew. Yet at the end, he's bearing witness. He falls in love and in a way he saves love. Can you talk about why it's really so crucial to know where we came from? Because... Knowing where we came from really directs where we're going in the future. Oh, sure. So he doesn't, I don't think you have to identify necessarily as a religious Jew to understand that you are part of a people. He knows firmly that he is part of this tradition of people who have lived, as he says, in Poland since the beginning of time, which isn't really true. Jews came to Poland, I think, around a thousand. So they've been there for almost a millennium. And he knows that although he, whether or not he believes in God, it doesn't really matter whether or not he believes in sort of the Jewish liturgy doesn't really matter. What he believes in is his place among these people. He is one of them. He knows that. He doesn't question that. So that's where he was, and that is where he is going. He is going to be part of this community, whether he likes it or not. He didn't make that choice, of course, the Nazis make it for him, but he, he, never, he never says, he never thinks, well, I, it's not fair that I'm here. I don't even believe in this stuff. He understands that these are his people, and this is where he's going to be. It's sort of a DNA link almost, and I... I want to ask because these characters were also indelible to me. And I just, I mean, I found myself crying in, in parts of the book because they were so real and they got so deep. I need to know what happened to Adam after the war? What do you imagine happened to him after the war? What about the kids? I think that the people, I don't want to know spoilers, but I think I can tell, you know, Adam does not, obviously it's a first person account. So if he died, that would be really rough. To, to <laughs> um, Adam lives and the people with him, I believe that they lived. I believe they made it to the United States and they lived. Good, thank you. Now I feel a little bit relieved. Um, did you ever, were there ever survi survivors that you could contact from some of the people in the archives? Or, oh no, oh. so the lines were just gone? Oh. Oh. Yes, That's people, heartbreaking. Well, it's not just, well, I mean, the, 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 the vast plurality of people who are in the Warsaw Ghetto did not make it out. Some did, of course, of course. Right. And I've met people, one of my cousin's fathers was in the ghetto. So, you know, Warsaw's, um, I'm sorry, Vladislav Spillman, who was the pianist, he was in the ghetto and made it out. Um, Roman Polanski was a Warsaw or a Krakow right. Jew, but he was in a ghetto. I don't think the Warsaw ghetto and he made it. So yes, of course people made it up, but the vast, vast majority did not. Um, yeah. Okay. This is just time. This was 80 years ago. So right. that's, right. that's right. That's right. That's right. That's true. Um, there's another interesting question that Adam asked that I'd like to ask you about what happened now. He asked what had happened to them, meaning the Nazis, uh, that they couldn't let you know, what had happened to them in their lives that they couldn't let us live ours? And I think that's a really interesting question. And I think that a lot of people who still, I mean, there's still Nazis around in America and in Germany. And I always wonder why are they so afraid of the other, you know, be it a Jew or a Muslim or, or anybody. What happened to them. And I actually want to ask you if you ever, there was a book that came out a few years ago about a woman who went undercover into the flat earth society to find out why the people believe what they believed. Yeah, that was amazing. Was, yeah what was so interesting about it is she discovered that they were very lonely people. And mm. this gave them a community. Mm. And she said the only way she was able to change anybody's opinion was if she befriended them. And and she would gently say things like, well, um, look, I've read this and I don't know what to think about it, but it says that the earth is round. Like, what would you think about it? So I was just wondering, like, what would make somebody think that hate is the thing that's going to strengthen our lives? It just seems the exactly wrong thing. 
Oh, I wish I, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. But I do think that search for community is, of course, part of it. And I do think, you know, if you think about like the anti-Semitism that's bubbling up right now, I mean, I think it's a, a perpetual trope that Jews specifically are somehow shadowy and powerful and that that they have figured out some secret to cheat the system and make themselves successful while you are not. Right. And I think you see that trope being played out constantly. Um, even it manifests in the discussion of the current horrible war in, in Israel and, and Gaza. I, I think that there's a lot of community, as you said, to be made in anti-Semitism, that a lot of people find the conspiracy theory connection or the, the resentment somehow, or just the, the, the fear of the other, and it, it all expresses itself in that way. That's why I think it's so important to, that's why I think this book is so really, really profoundly important because it's a, it's a record of life and the way that you wrote it is so, it's just, it's really shattering in a way because it's so intimate and it's so real and you really, down to every single little detail and you really feel that you are there. And it was very hard in reading when I had to get up and go to dinner or do whatever I to do to separate myself from that and feel I'm in a warm house. I'm not in a ghetto. I'm not hearing Jack books outside. So I want to talk about your writing ability because I've read and loved all your books from Reproduction is the Flaw of Love to this one. And what amazes me and also impresses me so much is that every book seems to me a progression of your talent. It seems sort of different. I mean, Reproduction of the Flaw of Love was lovely and smart about pregnancy and love. A friend of the family <laughs> was a dangerous, edgy fam, you know, family kind of thriller that Stephen King loves so much. He interviewed you about it. It <laughs> was wild. I know it's wild. Um, our short history was a moving break your heart story of a mother trying to come to terms with being a mother with her son and her impending death. The explanation of everything was about love and faith. And now you've written this book that it feels different from every other book of yours that I've read. Did you know that it was going to be, I mean, I know I asked you this before we came on, but did you know that this book was going to be this profoundly important to so many people while you were writing it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Carolyn, I know this is, it sounds like false modesty. I promise you it's not. I didn't know if it was any good and I sort of didn't care. I wrote it during the pandemic. Usually I have a few friends who are readers who I'll show my stuff to, but this was the pandemic when everyone's like homeschooling their kids and right. I was not right. going to ask people who are already at their wits end, like, hey, would you read my novel? <laughs> but during the pandemic, you know, I used to be very precious about writing. I was like, I need the right light and I need good coffee and I need silence. And it turned out I was never going to get those things, maybe the coffee and the pandemic. So what I had instead were like these stolen hours when my kids were in another room. I would snuck up to my son's room when he was in the basement playing video games or I would sit because I could never use my office because people were always running around. So I just in these stolen moments would sit and write a sentence or a paragraph or if I was lucky a page or two but I just I had these people living with me and living inside me and I wanted to write down what happened to them and that was it and I did not that that was my goal to get through the pandemic was to write this book and at the end when I was done I gave it to my agent and I said honestly might be good might not be good no one else has read it don't know but I was very proud of myself for having done a thing you know some people Baked sourdough, I tried my sourdough's garbage. Some people train for marathons, that's not me. I write books, I wanted to use this time somehow to make this, this awful time productive in some way. And so that's this is what I did with it. It's so amazing. That's the only goal. Is it true that you wrote this book in a couple of months? Well, yes and no. I, okay, so I went to Poland in 2019. Okay. I discovered this archive. I thought, I often write my books very quickly, but that only after having thought about them for truly like a year, a year and a half. I do a lot of writing in my head, not of scenes, but of people. So I'll start imagining people when I'm walking my dog, when I'm doing the dishes, when I'm folding laundry, I'm thinking about these people and what they were like. I'm, I'm in a sort of strange way, like talking to them or envisioning their physicality. 
so that by the time I sit down to write, I've done a year and a half of just this, this very enjoyable, but slightly intense imaginative work. And then I'm able to write quickly, not beca because I've, you know, because I, I've spent all this time with them already. That's incredible. I, another thing from Adam, Adam is vehement about the role that literature plays. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff, even playful literature, like there's actually a very funny part about the kids reciting the owl and the pussycat yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. poem, which I, I love. And I love that poem. You know, it's a very silly, wonderful poem. It's a bit of joy for yeah. the kids to incorporate. So Adam starts a project with his school children to gather their testimonies of life in the ghetto to make sure that no one ever forgets. Literature is tremendously important. And actually, now that people are going around banning books, which is just extraordinarily wrongheaded, it makes this book that you've written that much more extraordinary. I mean, I don't have a question about this. I just want to say that you've added on to the important role that literature plays. So I want to talk about memory. How did it feel to you writing this book? Because as I was reading it, I felt as if I was there, as if I was remembering something that I obviously had no part of. How were you able to write it in pieces and not cry your way through it? Um, or did you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I felt heartbroken writing some of it, although I could be pretty, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but just, just pretty matter of fact in the drafting and then in the rereading, it's when it gets me. Like if if something has to happen for the the, the integrity of the book, it's going to happen and I will feel bad about it later. You know, I I did cry a lot reading the source material, though I will say that. Um, getting, okay. through, getting through the records was sometimes funny, right? People told funny stories and sometimes joyful and sometimes boring, boring, boring. And then sometimes just devastating. Do you still feel those people around you? I mean, I do, I do. Always, I, I, think, so I think about them. I think about Adam, Years later, I've been that imagine I will fall asleep imagining his future. Uh, That's what I was doing. That's what I was doing. We have a lot of questions, so I'm going to put yeah. some up. Okay. okay. Robin says, would you please read the first sentence or paragraph? Do you mind? I would love to, but I will have to <laughs> okay. open up. Hold on one second. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. You ready? Okay, while we're waiting, I will say that Renee said hi from Southeast Florida. Hi, Renee. And Robin said, I know nothing about this story either. Imagine finding the rest of the buried archives. Oh, I think they think it's under the Chinese embassy. Um, okay, so I will read. Um, I will read the first two paragraphs. The man came to my classroom on December 14th, 1940, at 4.40 p.m. I wrote the time and date down immediately because he asked me to write down everything immediately and there was no reason not to comply. All the details, he said, even if they seem insignificant, I don't want you to decide what's significant. I want you to record. You are a camera and a dictaphone, both. He was tall with brown curly hair that seemed clean, newly cut. He had heavy brows and a sharp nose and all in all was handsome in a rather somber way, heavy-lidded eyes. He spoke educated Polish with an Eastern accent. His name was Emmanuel Ringelblum. It's wonderful. It's just wonderful. I, I, again, I want to tell people this is an absolutely must read important book. I mean, I've already bought a copy for my son, along with other copies of Lauren's books. And um, I'm going to be buying more because I think it's something that it's required reading for anybody who's human. It's absolutely required reading. Okay, so we have another question. Okay, from Anissa Joy Armstrong, what drew you to this particular story? Hi, Anissa. I love characters. Um, and when I saw this archive, there were just so many characters in it. And I just had this, you know, this, this glimpse of, of being able to sort of embroider upon the stories with so many individual people. <laughs> and that's what I love about being a fiction writer. And I do it again and again and again. Um, just sort of delving into the histories of individual people. So it was as simple as that. I did not set out to write a Holocaust story. I did not set out to write about Poland in the 1940s. 
I set out to sort of examine these individual people who I thought were fascinating. And we had that's I think they're fascinating too. And we have another question from Renee. Have you read A Jewish Journey by Sam Ron? I was fortunate to hear Sam speak several times and read his book. I have not, but Renee, if those are your dogs on your um, avatar, they are adorable. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a dog person. No, I haven't. I read the books that I read though, in, to inform this in case anyone's interested. You can read um, a book by Samuel Cassile called Who Will Write Our History that tells the whole story of this. You can also find Notes from the Warsaw Ghetto, which is Emmanuel Ringelblum's own memoir. Um, and those two were really, really helpful. And we have yet another question. Who is the hardest character to write about and why? Congrats on the RWJ pick. Yes, that RWJ pick, man, that is <laughs> very, very exciting. Um, the hardest character to write, I think, was Sala, who is the uh, woman. I don't think it's a spoiler. She, she, she's one of the women that is jammed into this apartment. You know, all these people have to give up their apartments and move into a new one. I wanted her to be um, engaging and smart and lovable without being cute, right? I did, you know, I really wanted to get her right. And the thing that I wanted most of all to radiate from her is that, that she just was really passionate about her children without being an overbearing mother, without hewing to any stereotypes, but just that she really loved her kids. Um, and so I just, I felt very careful about calibrating her and I hope I got it right. Okay, um, I'm speaking of historical, historical novels. I read that you've already sold another novel um, that's based in history about a woman. Oh, it's, it's not? not no, no, no. I'm not writing any more history. I mean, maybe I will right now. Oh, 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 oh. I thought, <laughs> I thought it was based on history. And I kept looking up saying, I've never heard of this in history. No, no, no. no. Um, to explain this novel is just to be, to sound a little insane. Um, I was going to write another historical fiction that quickly fell apart. And instead, so that is correct. I was going to try it. And then I started and I was like, this is, this is not going to happen for me. Um, I decompress these days uh, with, <laughs> Carolyn, I, this is going to sound insane. I watch a lot of, I, I work, I volunteer with animals and I watch a lot of animal videos. And so when I'm super stressed out, I watch videos of like a woman rehabbing a baby squirrel or <laughs> like a, like a, a Furby's mountain dog that went off the street. Like, you know, I, like I can't do drugs and my tolerance for alcohol is gone. Wait, this is what I do. And I started working on this novel about a woman who becomes very involved in, in trying to save a dog. But of course the dog is not really in the end what she's trying to save. And it's the first thing I've ever written um, third person female, which I find I've really enjoyed, like, like the perspective, the way that that sort of allows me to like look at character. And, um, and I'm about halfway done, which is great because it's due in February. Mm -hmm. oh, February. <laughs> you know, and, um, and I really have <laughs> time with things. So this is a little bit alarming, but I, I have been, you know, I, until now I was, I was humming along and, and of course, the past couple of weeks have been, it's been harder to talk. Crazy. I want to ask you, are you able to write it all now with all the acclaim rightfully showering down on you? Has it changed your feelings about what it is to be a writer? Or do you yeah. feel like the next oh, one has to be better? Or No, I just assume it won't be. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, this I, is why I love you. This is, this I, is like perfect. <laughs> deeply that about the luck that goes into this game, which is not to say that a certain amount of talent, of course, and a whole lot of hard work. I do believe that, you know, talent plus hard work equals a certain kind of luck, sure. But of the thousand books maybe that are published this month, mine was one of the good ones. But it, but some for some reason, you know, the, the winged goddess of literary luck sort of bat her wings at me and but I know that there's a certain amount of chance involved and that's fine I do not expect it to happen again and that's fine I tell my students and I really believe this that if you don't like the actual writing part of it 
don't do it. Because no matter what happens during publication, and I didn't know this, Caroline, when we first met, and I know it now, no matter what happens during publication, it will never replicate the joy you feel of having completed something you're proud of. No matter what, getting on, get the, the, the New York Times review, dazzling, made my day. But writing the, 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 the days and years long process of writing and thinking about writing this book made my year. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you just, that's why I do it. That's incredible. And that's really, really good advice. I mean, my next question was going to be, what's the best advice you give any writer? And you just answered that. And you also just answered the next one, which is what's the worst advice. But I do want to know, like, you're also a teacher. Yes. Um, what do your students teach you? Oh, gosh, so much. First of all, they teach me now, like, I've been doing this for 18 years. I've been at Rutgers for 18 years. So when I got the job, I was younger than some of my students. I mean, I was in my late 20s. And I, I just... I understood them completely, but 18 years later, um, they're, most of them are a different generation than me. So, so they're teaching me what it is to be a Gen Z, which is not, which is a very different stance. I know it's different. They're it's totally different. different. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And so I'm learning about the politics and perspectives, not of every, I mean, you can't generalize everyone in a generation that way, but like of, of they're teaching me a different way to see the world, which I really appreciate. They're teaching me about new writers. I wouldn't know. They're teaching me about the, the, the things that they care about, which are different from the things I care about, um, I love them. I love them. Are they approaching writing differently than yeah. your I generation? Think so. I think so. I think so. Um, I think that there's a, a politics. There's more of a political project in some of their work, whereas I was taught to keep politics completely out of what right. I did. That's right. But I don't know why that's better. I mean, I think that having a, a, a political slant or a point of view is also valid. I think that they see their work as, you know, expressions of who they are, whereas I saw my work as something that I did. You know, again, this is a broad generalization, but I, I see that sometimes in them. And it might just be a process, a, a product of age. Well, maybe when I was their age, I too saw my work as an extension of myself. Whereas now I see myself as a woman who does many, many different things. And writing That's right. Is, right? Writing is That's one right. of them. And it's something that I very much love, but it's not more of who I am than all the other things that I do. That's right. That's right. So uh, what question should I have asked that I didn't ask you? Mm. That is a good one. What have you, haven't you asked? How did I keep the secret about Jenna for so long? Yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Tell oh, us know. about that. Tell us about that. How did you find that? How, first oh, time, I, I did it February. I was in a hotel in Seattle. I was like, I was at a writer's thing and I was like, Wow. And they were like, you can't tell anyone. I was like, can I tell my husband? They're like, you can tell your husband. And that's it. Every time I wanted to spill to my mom, to my sister, who I talk to every day, you know, I just thought you will wake up at three in the morning and you will worry yourself sick that they will tell someone. And that kept me honest. I just kept thinking, think about how you're going to feel at 3 a.m. if you spill. And that did it for me. But what would, what would happen if you did spill? They wouldn't I, don't know. I, don't know. I have no idea what would have happened. They just make it sound very serious. So you don't spill. Right, right. right. You, spill, you know? Wow. That's incredible. That's like, I was, I was, you know, and then like everything else. But the other good thing I think about having nine months is like the thrill, as thrilling as it is, has to dissipate. You can't stay in the state of right. like, oh my God right. for nine months. So instead, I went back to the writing, like, like it was, it was this, this example in real time of like how it's not the stuff that comes up around publication as amazing as that is. It's about the, the joy of like inventing new worlds and coming up with good plots and thinking about people and, and visiting new places and all of that. That's like great. It's to, it's totally it's totally fantastic. I mean, it's always fan. I always say that you know, writers writers are on the sea, and it's always fantastic when one like gets up to the shore or grows a mermaid tail or whatever. And I've got to say, it's even better when it happens to somebody who's such a great person as you are. I mean, it really couldn't have happened to a 
too nice a person. I still remember the day we met. And oh, then yeah. it was an Algonquin reading. And it was you, me, Tayari Jones. Oh, my and I God. forget who else. Gosh. I forget who else. It was really fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And every time I see you, every time you pop up somewhere on social media, I just, my heart swells. I just think you are one of those allies and good people, and the world doesn't have enough of you, so. Yeah. You're going to make me cry. I've cried enough during your book. All right. <laughs> I want to tell everybody, I want to remind you once again, walk to your favorite independent bookstore and buy this book. Go to bookshop.org if you want it, and they'll direct you to your nearest indie bookstore and buy the book. Buy the book, buy several copies, give it to friends. It's a wonderful, amazing, human, humane book. It's a perfect book to give for the holidays. And it's not like you're giving a really, it's not a depressing. It's not. That's the thing. I, I feel like I have to keep it's full it. of life. Yeah. It's full of life. It's also full of love. It's redemptive. It's the perfect book. Go and do Even it. It's Have funny. Me. Sometimes it's funny. It's funny. Oh, yeah, oh. The all in the pussycat still makes me laugh. Yeah. So go and do that. We'll see you all next week. Lauren, you hang on. Um, so thank you all. And thank you all for the comments. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you.